Welcome to our From Classroom to Virtual Instructor Tech and Tips webinar. My name is Lisa Damaris. I'm the Vice President of Appraisal Issues here at the Appraisal Foundation. You are most likely watching this because you are a classroom instructor who would like to teach virtual classes more effectively. If so, welcome. We will cover the best tips on how to take your teaching from the classroom to a virtual platform. While there are many different types of virtual teaching platforms, there's Zoom, WebEx, Microsoft Teams, Google Hangouts, we will use Zoom for most of our examples because it is the most common virtual teaching platform at the moment. We will not teach you how to teach, but we will show you how you convert your classroom teaching to a virtual setting. The list of tips that we have compiled for you come directly from other instructors of appraisal courses. These tips are their recommended best practices for virtual classes. Our list certainly does not include all tips, but it's a great start. Today, we will cover what to do to set up your teaching platform, what to do on the day of class, and what to do after the class, specifically requesting feedback from many of your students. We also have a few clips from these current instructors on their favorite tips while teaching virtually. These instructors are also live right now in the chat room so you can ask them any questions at any time. Additionally, we will share resources, essentially handouts, in the chat window. So keep an eye on the chat box. We will be sharing a lot of links for you to use to follow along and don't worry about copying them down. After this presentation, we will be posting the video and some handouts, which will include all of the links from today's video. During the meeting, you will be able to get feedback in real time, remember that. Finally, I want to mention that while we are answering questions throughout the presentation and at the end of the presentation, we will not have a chance for you to practice these tips today during the presentation. However, we will be setting up in the near future a Zoom meeting for any instructors who wish to practice the technical aspects of Zoom. Be sure and indicate your interest and availability for this practice session by making sure that you fill out the survey at the very end of this presentation. All right, before we begin, let me quickly introduce our panelists, all of whom are AQB qualified USPAP instructors. We'll start with Larry Disney, and I will let the rest of the panelists introduce themselves in no particular order. Good morning. Uh, my name is Larry Disney, and I am honored to be a panelist and present today uh, what I have found to be such a rewarding experience in education. Uh, I've been involved with real estate appraiser education and real estate in general education spanning many years, beginning in uh, 1977 with the development and offering of classroom courses. Since 2018, uh, I've been developing and instructing synchronous distance education courses. And that is true, especially for the past few months in the pandemic. Uh, I've developed both qualifying and continuing education using the Zoom platform for both uh, real estate agents and brokers and real estate appraisers. And I am embracing the evolution of uh, the course offerings in Zoom. As you know, these uh, times are requiring constant uh, retooling and updating of course materials in a way that can be offered using more student involvement. And I have found the Zoom platform to offer many of those uh, items I will talk about more later but it has really been rewarding and I have found it to be an excellent tool. Thank you, Lisa. I really appreciate the opportunity to participate in this webinar and I'm really looking forward to an interesting exchange of ideas here. My name is Dan Bradley. I'm a certified general appraiser. I've been involved in appraisal education, uh, live classroom is how I got my start since 1992. And I started writing and instructing asynchronous online courses 
around 2005, and I've been instructing synchronous online courses since 2012. And I have a CDEI, Certified Distance Education Instructor, designation from IDEC. Thank you, Lisa. My name is Joanne Apostle, and I'm a certified residential appraiser, a certified USPAP instructor, and a certified distance education instructor. I've been appraising since 2000, after I left my job as a seventh grade math teacher in public schools for 15 years. I teach for Kaplan North America and have been an instructor for the appraisal product line since 2005. We have recently launched a full licensing CE and USPAP product line in the live online format. My educational background does include specialized focus on education for my degree in mathematics and I have a minor in special education. The best part about teaching appraisal is that I can meld my first love for teaching with my second career. Thank you, Lisa. It's a pleasure to take part today. For those that don't know me, my name is Heather Sullivan and I serve as senior leader of the Columbia Institute. I'm a certified distant education and AQB certified USPAP instructor, course author, and national qualifying and continuing education provider. In March, like many others, the Columbia Institute transitioned all our in-person classes to a live streaming platform. In the process, we have learned a lot about our students, our instructors, our delivery platform, and our management of the process. I personally have had to adjust my teaching style to better perform in a virtual environment. So I'm excited to have the opportunity to share with you all some of my best practices and a few of the techniques I've picked up along the way. Well, thank you, Lisa. I'm, I'm glad to be here. My name is Mark Lewis. I'm a real estate appraiser in Lufkin, Texas. Uh, I've been a classroom instructor for many years and taught, you know, 120 plus classroom uh, sessions. But uh, this distance education and teaching synchronously is a little new for me, so I'm glad to be here. Great. Thank you for joining us today. Well, let's get started. Section one is all about setup. Things that you might need. Your computer, strong internet connection, a web camera, microphone, professional background, good lighting, and multiple monitors. Let's start with tip number one, Zoom. As we mentioned, we will be using Zoom as a sample virtual teaching platform. While Zoom has a ton of resources on their website, we will focus on their key features and tips. The starting price for Zoom is $15 a month, and it allows for up to 100 participants and unlimited meetings and courses. If you think about the cost of an in-person meeting, including travel, meeting rooms, hotels, refreshments, the virtual setting is much more affordable. Thus, you will need to download the Zoom app on your computer. To do so, go to zoom.us, which you can see the link over there in the chat box, and download the desk application so that you can access it from your computer. Next, you will need to create your Zoom account on their website. When doing this, we highly recommend that you upload your professional headshot. It just takes your presentation up a notch. So loom into your Zoom account on the web, remember zoom.us, click on change under the profile image, click on upload, select an image to your computer, click open and then save. Now for your virtual classroom, now you're ready to create your first virtual class. We will quickly show you how to create a meeting. There are several ways to create a meeting. You can go online to zoom.us and log in or you can use your desktop, desktop application. We're gonna show you how to do it online. Once you log into your account, click the Meetings tab and select the button labeled Schedule a New Meeting. Here you can enter in all of your relevant information. Topic is the name of the meeting and how it will appear to others. Of course, you can enter in your date and time and then you're into your settings. Now there are many options for settings, so it's up to you to decide how secure you want your meeting to be. Meeting ID will either be your personal meeting ID or generated automatically. Your personal meeting ID can be joined at any time and it will always be the same. Automatically generated IDs 
will be the ID that is created just for your this one meeting. And then if you want to amp up your security, select require meeting password. A password is automatically generated, but you can change it to anything you want. This ensures that only participants with the password are able to join your meeting. This is also a button to, there is also a button to enable a waiting room. And actually Larry will talk about this in just a moment. The rest of the settings are pretty intuitive. You can choose either to start the meeting with the video on or the video off for you and for your participants. And there are also different calendar options available. Muting the participants upon entry will mute the participants. You can also choose to automatically record the meeting in your Zoom cloud or on your computer. Once you have your preferred settings selected, be sure and press save. Review all of your information to make sure it's the way you want it to be. And now you have a class scheduled. You can share that Zoom invite with your students. This is the link that they will click, click on the day of the class to join your virtual classroom. Larry, can you tell us a little bit more about the waiting room feature? Thank you. Uh, the, the waiting room feature <clears throat> is available prior to each session. And uh, we set our uh, login for the students to begin 30 minutes prior to the course beginning. Now that would be fluid. If you think there's going to be a lot of folks coming in who have never used Zoom, you might want to have a one-on-one -on -one discussion with uh, the, the group as each individual comes in you can set that 30 minutes uh, to a greater uh, length of time. But we have found 30 minutes uh, prior to the course beginning works well. And the, uh, it prevents participants from join, joining automatically uh, whenever they wish or to check out whenever they wish. It's very secure and you have them waiting in, in the waiting room. You can have communications with them, I do. Uh, just how are you doing today, uh, et cetera. So, so it works very well. And, and again, they can only enter the waiting room if they have a specific link for the course that is being offered for the date and time uh, that they are logging in. So they have to be cleared uh, by the monitor or by the instructor. And I personally like to have a monitor because I'm getting ready for class, just like in a classroom, uh, you get to the class site uh, 45 minutes before it's ready to start. And invariably there'll be three people lined up waiting for the course and you uh, take time to register those folks in or tell them to wait until you get uh, everything uh, set up. That's the same option you have for Zoom. You, uh, you can set the uh, waiting room to your desire. Thank you, Larry. Now we're gonna move on to tip number two, strong internet. You don't wanna lose your internet right in the middle of your class, so you may wanna plug in your ethernet cable directly into your computer so you are not relying on your Wi-Fi while you're teaching. This is also a great suggestion to tell your students. Tip number three, students love to see their instructor. So please make sure that you have a newer web camera that has a clear video picture of you. There are many affordable but high quality webcams on the market. In our chat room, we have included a link to some of a list of the best cams that are currently on the market. They are super easy to set up. You simply plug them into your computer and place them on your monitor. Then play around with the camera location and the angle a little bit to make sure it's at eye level as much as possible so the students feel like they're looking right at you making eye contact. Make sure to place the camera on the screen that you are gonna be looking at the most. For instance, if you frequently refer to notes or pages on a second monitor for talking points, try to position those near the webcam so you are looking into the webcam as much as possible instead of reading your notes like this. This will make it seem like you're looking at your students. Eye contact is essential in live classroom presentations and it's also important in synchronous online presentations. Now at this point, we all know the work from home advice about getting dressed and ready like it's a regular work day. But if you still don't think you're looking your best, Zoom's 
touch up my appearance feature may be just what you're looking for. If you've ever used the beauty mode on your phone selfie camera, I haven't. You know what you're getting. To turn on the touch up my appearance filter, simply click on the upside down carrot that is next to the video button on your Zoom toolbar. Click on the video settings and select the check mark, check mark next to touch up my appearance. You can now close out of your settings. Finally, be sure that you fill your screen and that you are not very, very tiny or very, very large or off at an odd angle or over to one side. You should look like you are on a professional TV interview. Tip number four, can you hear me? Audio is very important. Your students might be tolerant of your bad lighting or your blurry camera video, but if they cannot hear you, they won't be tolerant of you at all. If possible, close doors during presentations in order to minimize interruptions. If you have noisy household members, two-legged or four-legged members, use a headset with a microphone instead of your computer's built-in speakers and microphone. This will help minimize background noise that may distract both you and your students. There are many different headsets to choose from. There's over-ear, in-ear, Bluetooth, even bone conduction. Feel free to try out several to see what works best for you. In general, headphones and headsets have a dedicated microphone and they'll pick up sound better than those without this feature. To find out more about some of the best headsets for video conferences, check out the link in the chat box. Make sure that any set that you, headset that, use, that you use are comfortable for all they use. The last thing you want is burning ears at the end of the day. Our panelist, Mark Lewis, has some thoughts about being heard and about being able to hear. Mark? Yes, Lisa, I appreciate the question. Uh, one thing I found from my limited experience as a instructor teaching synchronously is the advantages of using headphones. Uh, sometimes the computer audio is just way too echoey and if you can't control the noise behind you, it, uh, it can be distracting. So I would recommend using headphones. Uh, what I have got on now is just, uh, they are bone conducting headphones, uh, which were recommended to me and they have worked really well. Uh, what I like about them is they sit on the outside of the ears and you can still hear the ambient noise around you. They're a little different than having a, a big cup over your ears. Uh, but the audio quality is really good and uh, in the, uh, the speaking quality is very good. So they're, they're not terribly expensive. They're $100, $150, and you can find them in, in a lot of different outlets. But uh, I would recommend using headphones and, and not relying solely on your, your computer audio. Oh, thank you, Mark. Those headphones actually look very interesting. It's not usually an issue, but if your room has an echo, you can always add some dampening materials such as a rug, pillows, or curtains to your room to alleviate the ceiling and the floor echo. To learn more about this, check out the link in the chat box. Tip number five, your professional background. Due to the sudden shift to online teaching, you might not have a dedicated workspace or an office for teaching. So if possible, try to create a professional looking background with items such as frame certificates and awards, tasteful artwork, curated books on a bookshelf, etc. Another great option is to use a professional virtual background. The background can be branded for your organization like you see here, or just be any professional office setting. You will get a chance to see what other backgrounds you can use shortly when you hear more tips from our current instructors. Please note that not all instructors will be able to set up a virtual background because some computers have limitations in what they allow. To determine if your computer can handle a virtual background, please check out the link in the chat box. Now, to set up your virtual background, click on the upside down carrot next to the video button on your Zoom toolbar and choose virtual background. From here, you can choose a background that is either preloaded into Zoom 
or you can click on the plus button to add your own background. Please note that the photo that you want to use of yourself or of your background might already have to be saved on your computer for you to access it and add it as your Zoom background. For more information, go to the chat box. Tip number six, good lighting. Let's talk about good lighting. It's very awkward when your instructor is in total or near darkness or when they have a partially lit face. You can do much better than this. Make sure that you face the light so that your whole face is lit evenly. How do you do this? You place your light source in front of you. This can be done by sitting in front of a window or placing a lamp in front of you. Spoiler alert, I have both in front of me. Sunlight might be easiest for your eyes, especially for a long class. Just make sure you are not so bright that you are shining. You can view how you look by using the Zoom settings menu and testing your video. We'll go over this shortly. Tip number seven, multiple monitors. It seems like most instructors love to have multiple monitors when they teach a class. Here are some examples of instructor setups. One monitor can have your notes. The second can have a video gallery showing all the students, the chat window, and a participant list. and a third monitor can have your PowerPoint slide. You can find out the maximum number of students that you can see on your screen. Zoom has a maximum setting of 25. Before you have to scroll to the next page to see all the rest of the students. But if your computer meets certain specified requirements, you can view up to 49 students at one time. Regardless, multiple screens will make your life much easier so you have space for all of your resources. And with this in mind, Dan, would you like to impart some wisdom about your class size? Thanks, Lisa. I'm glad you asked that. When offering a synchronous online course, it's advisable to limit your class size to the number of students to whom you're able to provide personalized attention. Now, this really is more of an administrative issue than an instructional issue, but in some schools, the instructor does double duty and also serves as the administrator. Just as with group size in a live classroom, there's a limit to what an instructor can handle by himself or herself. Some schools have a moderator or multiple moderators taking attendance and providing technical assistance to students, and in those situations, an instructor can probably handle a larger number of students. Thank you, Dan. And also Heather has a tip for us on clarifying student expectations. Yes, Lisa. I have a couple of suggestions on the preparation side of things to help new virtual instructors get off to a smooth start. One tip is to make sure to provide students with a clear understanding of all expectations and class rules at the start of class. Leading things up to interpretation may lead to unnecessary heartache and awkward confrontations between you and the student. For example, if webcams are required, make sure to explain what that means in detail. For instance, tell students in order to receive CE credit, it is mandated that they keep their webcams on the entire duration of class and that they are visibly present in the frame. Let them know they can turn it off during each break, but must turn it back on when they return. By stating these expectations up front, it sets the standard for the day and puts the obligation on the student to comply. If the student chooses, to, chooses not to follow the rules, then they know the consequences. This same etiquette goes for what happens when a student runs into technical issues, how attendance is tracked, what's expected in terms of class participation, and anything else that falls under the class management side of things. If you're using technology to track attendance and participation, make sure the student knows how it works and what is expected to achieve credit. The last thing you want is a student to attend class all day only to find out they didn't answer a few of the required questions and won't be receiving credit. If you leave the class rules and expectations vague, you will be shocked at how many different ways they can be misinterpreted. 
I've had students try taking the class from their cell phone while on the road completing inspections or wanting to point their webcams at the ceiling all day. And of course, once one starts, they all think they can do it. So anything you can do to set the ground rules before class starts will ensure you maintain good control over the class while you're teaching. Great. Thanks, Heather. Practice makes perfect. It's so important that actually two of our panelists would like to speak about practice makes perfect. Dan? Absolutely, Lisa. Practice is critically important. An instructor needs to spend time practicing with the presentation software. Now, this is something that I learned by doing it wrong for a period of time. And in a live classroom, you are the presentation software. There's nothing between you and the student. However, in a virtual classroom, there's a program like Zoom or WebEx that's used to advance slides or switch screens or open up other apps or, or whatever. And some online instructors, they don't practice. They just assume the role of presenter or subject matter expert and they don't take the time to become competent in using the presentation software. I've seen instructors who throughout their entire presentation ask the moderator to advance to the next slide every time they need it. And that's awkward and it interrupts the flow of the presentation. An instructor's lack of technical knowledge can also lead to uncomfortable moments for the instructor when things don't go as planned. For example, the instructor has difficulty logging in or they hit a wrong key and they wind up on a screen they've never seen before. Practice is boring. Ask any athlete, but it always pays off later. An instructor's lack of technical competence often results in a less than stellar student experience. Now, an instructor is not expected to be a technical wizard or an IT professional, but they should be able to navigate the program without too much assistance. As a bonus to all this practice, an instructor who is fully competent in the technical aspects of the program is more able to provide timely technical assistance to students who may need it. Thanks again, Dan. Mark. Would you like to speak about practice? Yes, Lisa, I appreciate the question also uh, and appreciate the opportunity to, to, to give this suggestion that uh, what I have found is there's a sometimes difficulty and a little awkwardness in moving between your share screen and your gallery mode. Uh, my recommendation to you is to practice that because you can't get it uh, and see the gallery mode in your PowerPoint when you only have one or two people on, on the screen. So it would help if you would get some of your friends to log into a session and see a gallery and be able to move effectively between your, your, your share screen and viewing the gallery mode. And the easier that is to transition back and forth and maybe even to use multiple screens doing that will help you in, in making a seamless transition between your, your PowerPoint and your actual video. So that would be a, another good suggestion for you also. Wow, so many great tips about practice. Well, let's move on. What do you do your first day of class? This is section two, the day of the class. The first day of teaching an online class can be stressful, but you are already well on your way to having a successful class online just by following the setup tips we just went over. Now it's the day of class. You're nervous, you're jittery. So let's calm those nerves down by doing what the early bird does. What does the early bird do? Birds set things up early. Set up your notes and your teaching materials. Check your audio and your video. Join the class early. Chat with students and have technical support. Oh, well, I went over that kind of quick. Do you want more details so that you're more prepared? No worries. Let's discuss all of these things in details. Detail. Tip number eight, set up your notes and your teaching materials. Spend some time before you even join the Zoom session, pulling up any notes and your teaching materials and making sure that your screen looks ready for teaching. Do a quick run through of some of your slides. Tip number nine, test 
your audio, and your video. Make sure you test yourself speaking with no background noise. To test your sound, lighting, and video, go to zoom.us slash test. That link is over in the chat box. This is the best way to see and to hear how you appear to others. Tip number 10, dual monitors. If you have two or three monitors set up as suggested, one of the first things you may wanna do is select dual monitors in your settings. How do you do this? You click the upside down carrot next to the video and click video settings. On the side panel, click the general tab. Make sure the checkbox use dual monitors is selected. This allows for you to have your PowerPoint slides and your screen share on one screen and the gallery, the gallery view of all of your students on the other screen. To find out more about this setting, go to the chat box. Tip number 11, join the class early. Once you have satisfied with, once you are satisfied with how you look and how you sound, you're ready to start class. You should plan to join class early so you can mentally prepare, interact with your students, and get everything running to start class on time. Our panelist, Dan, has some excellent advice on, advice on this. Dan? I recommend that online instructors log into the class early and use that time to interact with the students, whether through actual audio or video conversation or through typed chat depending, of course, on the capabilities of the program. Now, this replicates one of the best aspects of the classroom experience, which is that students have access to the instructor during non-class time. As we all know, some of the most meaningful learning for both the instructor and the student occurs during unofficial class time. If possible, it's a good idea to greet each student personally as they connect into the course, just as you would greet them when they walk into the live classroom. It makes the experience more personal for the student and it immediately opens up a line of communication between the student and the instructor. Oh, that's great information, Dan, thanks. Additionally, encourage your students to log in early on the first day to test their audio and video equipment to avoid disruptions during class. Tip number 12, this is where technical support personnel comes in. If possible, Try to have a technical support person available to work with you the day of class. You have to plan for tech issues like students dropping off and then logging back on with more than one computer or browser window, or students not even be able to figure out how to raise their hand or use the chat feature. You're gonna need an extra pair of hands to help with ones that are struggling so that you can focus on the rest of the class. Tip number 13, moderating. In addition to having tech support, it may be useful to also have a moderator. Our panelist, Joanne, has more to say on this issue. Thanks, Lisa. Moderating is a big task, and it isn't a job for the instructor. Checking IDs and helping students with technology issues is only part of the job. The moderator has to launch three polling questions per hour. This takes skill in multitasking. Once a polling question is launched, you have to document the time and turn it off at the end, which is 90 seconds in our protocol. If the student doesn't respond, know how to do the next steps and practice it. Communicate with the instructor on timing of launching polling questions and know what happens on the student end of the system. Create or find a moderator report that is easy to use and be prepared to modify it halfway through the day if needed. The moderator should request students that have tech issues to notify them in the chat box right away if they had to drop or restart. This is a proactive measure to make sure students know if they may have missed a polling question or had technical issues which removed them from the classroom. Great point, Joanne. Having a moderator is extremely useful. Okay, so now you are all set up and you're ready for class. What do you need to do as your class begins? There are four tips in this section. These tips are all related to the student, how they interact, checking their IDs, and making introductions. Tip 14, participants and attendance. As students are joining, on the bottom of your Zoom screen, there is a button labeled participants. 
clicking on this button will show a list of everybody that is currently signed into the course and the names that they logged in with. This is a great way to take attendance and to make sure that everybody has joined. However, this is only useful if you can determine who is who. Make sure that participants rename themselves using their actual full first and last names. But you can also rename the students in here in case they join with the name of their laptop or their spouse's name. It happens. Check the chat box for a link on more details of how to rename students. As this is arguably one of the best features of teaching online, constantly being able to link a student's face to their name. Tip number 15, student video and audio. As students join and hopefully rename themselves as themselves, if needing to see the students is necessary to the course, encourage them to turn their cameras on. This allows you to view students' faces and expressions as you would in a live classroom setting. Students can stay unmuted until class begins, but then pick a time to make a formal announcement that students should mute themselves just as the class starts. You will most likely have to constantly remind students to mute themselves. Also, don't be afraid to mute all the students if you need. If a student has some background noise that lasts more than 10 seconds, then feel free to automatically mute just them. If you are unable to determine what student is making the noise or speaking, you can check it in two ways. There's a yellow green border around somebody, which indicates when they are the active speaker. Also, when a person is truly asking a question, you can use this same method of looking for that yellow green border to note who is talking and you can address that student by name, making the interaction more personable and engaging. This is another good reason why you may either limit your class size, the number of students you can see on one screen, or have a tech helper to tell you which person is asking a question. Another method, especially useful for background noise, is that you can view what students have their mics muted or not by pulling up the participants menu. This is also where you can mute the students yourself. Our panelist, Joanna Postle, has great information about muting yourself. Thanks, Lisa. An instructor should always mute the microphone when you leave your computer for break, no matter what. Your audience can hear what goes on when you are away from your computer. My, me my regional manager was monitoring a class and told me about an instructor who had a restroom close to her office. She didn't mute her microphone when she went on break. Imagine what the students could hear because she didn't mute the mic. I even caught myself the other day doing a big arm. It can be very embarrassing for you and the students. Great story, Joanne. I will be sure and always mute myself from now on. Tip number 16, checking IDs. If checking IDs are required, start class a bit early to make sure you have time to check. You can enlarge a student's video by pinning students' videos to check IDs. Some instructors have students take a picture of their ID and email it to them immediately before class to help with the process. You can send them an email reminder a few days before the class to make sure that they have some form of identification handy, driver's license, passport, military ID, etc. You can also suggest they cover all of their private information when showing their ID to the video camera, since you only need their full name and their photo to be visible. Tip number 17, introductions. Introductions are a great way for students to get to know who you are, get to know one another, and for you to get to know your students. Most instructors have some form of this for classroom courses, and you shouldn't stop just because you're teaching online. Tell students what you hope to hear from them about and encourage them to all unmute themselves to speak and to mute themselves again when they're done. Once all of your students have joined the class, you can lock the meeting to make sure external participants cannot join. Larry, can you talk about this a little bit more? Yes, absolutely, and thank you. Uh, you can lock the meeting uh, using the security feature that's available in the platform. This prevents other attendees from joining once the meeting has started, and it also presents anyone getting in to hack and create controversy or problems for you 
uh, during the session. So it, it keep, not only keeps out unwanted guests, but it's also great for enforcing a tart, uh, when someone has a tardiness policy. And we lock our sessions after 10 minutes of class beginning. And that 10 minutes applies to every break. Uh, they have to come back in within uh, three minutes of the break starting. If they leave the class, we note they left, we note the time they come back. So uh, it, is, uh, it is a great security feature. Thank you, Larry. Okay, you have successfully set up your class, begun class, and now you're in the midst of teaching. We have several more tips for you while you're teaching the class. These include how to share your screen and your PowerPoint slides, interacting with the students, and how to chat, and how to create and manage breakout rooms. Tip number 18. Share your screen and your PowerPoint slides. How are you gonna be, be presenting your materials? Most instructors like to either share a PowerPoint presentation or to share their screen with their own materials. To do so, click on the share screen in Zoom and then select the screen or the document that you would like to share in case you have multiple monitors. You can also push pause screen share if you would like to temporarily check something else. For example, if a student asks a question from slide 20, but you're all the way out on slide 65, you can pause, go to that slide, and then click resume share to show that slide. This allows for a seamless transition on the viewer's end, the student's end. To learn more about sharing your screen about pausing, just look in the chat box. Tip number 20, engagement. One of the most difficult aspects of teaching online is engaging students. So much so that we have two panelists who would like to speak about this issue. Heather has some great tips about using technology to share about engaging students in this new setting. Heather? Lisa, this is one of my favorite tips to bring up because engagement is key for productive learning. As an instructor, what you do does not change in a virtual environment, only how you do it changes. We all learned from instructor development training that the average retention rate for a student when we simply lecture or have them read text is less than 10%. Think about that, less than 10%. For this reason, we can't expect to get in front of a webcam and lecture for seven hours. Effective education doesn't happen by accident. It takes an incredible instructor that is thoughtfully prepared for class and is able to successfully execute proven learning strategies while delivering important content. When you look at the learning pyramid, most learning takes place when students practice doing or teach others to do. Knowing this is proven, I challenge every one of you to flip the classroom and focus more class time on activities, case studies, and peer-to-peer -peer learning. This is no better, there is no better opportunity to do so than in a virtual environment. In a virtual environment, every student has a computer in front of them with access to the internet and all of their appraisal tools, data sources, and applications. Take advantage of this whenever you can. The student's accessibility to these tools provide you with the facilities to develop learning programs that better replicate a real world environment. Use technology to aid in flipping the classroom. Tools like screen sharing can be used to have students show their work. Breakout rooms can be used for smaller work groups or peer to peer learning. Virtual backgrounds, discussion boards, polling and emojis can be leveraged to quickly allow students to express their thoughts or provide context to the lesson. Again, these are just a few features and examples of how learning can be more engaging and adapted so students are able to practice doing or teaching others to do. Now that I have your wheels spinning with all these great ways you can make education more interactive and relevant in the virtual world, I do want to take a step back and warn you to keep it simple at first. Test any new tool or technique before you introduce it in a live class setting and only add a new method once you've mastered it. 
Also think about your students skill level and what it takes to coach them through the new technology. Sometimes class size plays an important role in how you deliver the training. This will help you avoid any activity falling flat or derailing the class altogether. I'll stop there, but if anyone has any questions or wants additional ideas on how to flip the classroom, please reach out to me directly. I'd love to share my ideas with you. Wow, Heather, your classes seem extremely engaging. I mean, thank you for those tips. And Joanne now has some great teaching tips for keeping students engaged. Thanks, Lisa. The number one complaint about USPAP is that it's boring. As an instructor, you should brainstorm ways to make it interactive. Whether you encourage students to give a thumbs up in the chat box or use a vote manager system, spend some time formulating questions that will get a yes or no response. Ask the question and wait for students to start responding. I asked if you needed to name intended users in a restricted appraisal report two to three times in a recent USPAP class. The responses were 50-50 until we covered the material three times. So use those significant changes in USPAP to test what your audience knows to elicit responses. If you don't have this capability, have students email questions ahead of time or ask questions in the chat box. Encourage students, if possible, to share their experiences with the group. There's always a student who has experiences that the group may find interesting or useful. I had a chief appraiser who does reviews volunteer and the group appreciated hearing from him and thanked him for his feedback. Great engagement tips, Joanne, thank you so much. Tip number 21, polling. As mentioned, one way to engage in students is through polling. You can create multiple choice polling questions before the meeting begins or during class if something comes to you and you have participants choose an answer on the screen. You can have single choice questions or multiple choice questions they can be anonymous, and it's also a really fun way to increase interactivity, or you can also use it as a way to continually monitor attendance. Once you close the poll, you can even share the answers with the students if you want. To learn more about setting up polls, check the link in the chat box. Tip number 22, nonverbal feedback. In a classroom setting, a student might raise their hand if they have a question or you may be able to just tell if a student is confused and if they need you to repeat a point. While you can use video to try and replicate the classroom experience, Zoom has a variety of nonverbal feedback options that you can enable. These include buttons such as go slower, go faster, thumbs up, thumbs down, clap, and buttons to simply indicate yes and no. The icon will appear next to the name of the participant when they click on the button. However, one of the most useful tools is the raise hand button. Students can raise their hands and via the participant menu, you as the instructor can monitor the raising of the hands and call on students who have questions. Once the student virtually raises a hand, that hand icon will appear at the top of the participants list in the order in which they raise their hand. When you're ready to call on students to answer their questions, you can unmute them or you can call them by name and they can unmute themselves. And once you're done speaking with that students, you can click on the lower hand button next to their name. You can find out more information about the raising hands feature and other nonverbal communication by clicking on the link in the chat box. Tip number 23, chat. Chat is another wonderful tool to utilize when teaching online. Some students may feel more comfortable asking questions via chat, and they can also post questions if they're, having, or if they're having any technical issues. Our panelist, Larry, would like to discuss a little bit more about using the chat feature. Larry? Yes, a, a great feature of uh, the Zoom platform is you can communicate as the instructor uh, with the uh, students uh, to chat meaning anytime a person has a question, they can either raise their hand, the uh, symbol for hand being raised, or they can uh, chat and it will show 
on the uh, instructor screen. Uh, so uh, again, this is something either the class monitor can always lock or the instructor can lock the chat feature so that the attendees are not privately uh, talking to each other. Uh, like sometimes you have people in class that invariably will sit with friends and want to talk the entire time rather than uh, pay attention or listen. So that's, that's why I think the chat feature is one of the best uh, features in the program. It, it, it allows direct two-way communication, the whole purpose of education. We're just separated by distance. We can communicate, talk, and, and have the uh, beauty of being one-on-one uh, -on -one or as a group. Great point, Larry. Let's just quickly go over this feature. Only host. This allows students to send messages privately just to you. However, you can send message to everyone publicly or privately. Everyone publicly means that participants can send messages publicly to everyone or privately to the host. Everyone publicly and privately. This means students can send messages to everyone publicly or to anyone, including other students, privately. Find out more about using chat at the link in the chat box. Tip number 24, annotation. You can annotate your slides or any other document that you are sharing to add interaction to your presentation. Simply enable annotation and then you are free to draw, to add text, to spotlight text, and more. Again, to find out how to annotate, just click on the link in the chat box. Tip number 25, breakout rooms. Finally, one of the best tools to increase student engagement and to allow students a chance to interact more personally is breakout rooms. You can strategically or automatically assign students to breakout rooms where they are free to talk and to complete a task or just to have a discussion. While in the breakout room, if students have any questions or if they need clarifications, they can simply press a button, call for the instructor to enter their room. These rooms are a great tool, but intentionality is the key. So design your lessons with breakout rooms in mind. To learn more about breakout rooms, visit the link in the chat box. Tip number 26, pausing and asking for questions. Now, actually, Dan has some thoughts on how to allow for, allow for questions in your virtual classrooms. Dan? Well, Lisa, one of the things I like to do is to take frequent pauses and ask for questions from students. Obviously, it's a good practice in a live classroom, but it's particularly important in synchronous online courses also, particularly in courses where students have access to a webcam and a microphone. In a lot of cases, the students want to ask questions, but they're reluctant to do so for fear that they'll be interrupting the instructor. In a live classroom, you raise your hand and you get recognized. In a virtual classroom, you may not be able to see as the instructor a student raising their hand and they're not just going to chime in. So pausing frequently and soliciting questions or comments, particularly after a, an important point has been made, facilitate student engagement. It makes them feel important, like they're part of the class, and also, most importantly, allows them to get answers to their questions without making them feel like they're interrupting. Great tip. Thank you, Dan. Tip number 27, final tips. To end this section, we just wanted to mention a couple of miscellaneous tips to help you be the best instructor that you can be. Number one is be extremely punctual. Start on time and end on time. Number two, take regularly scheduled breaks. Use a countdown timer to ensure that everyone returns from break on time and give exact times. Mark, can you tell us about what you learned about taking breaks in the virtual classroom? Yes, Lisa. One, one thing that I have found out uh, from teaching classroom, live classrooms, is that, you know, we were generally there for seven or eight hours a day. And, you know, taking breaks uh, often is sometimes it interrupts the material. And so oftentimes we will take uh, longer breaks, but fewer breaks. 
when we are meeting in a traditional classroom setting. But what I found out really quickly is teaching synchronously and live that you really need to take more breaks than what you would normally take. Uh, the last session I did, I, I took breaks, a uh, 10 minute break every hour. And if you watch your gallery screen, you'll start seeing people get a little fidgety uh, after about 50 minutes of class in a synchronous setting. And so I would highly recommend taking more breaks than what you would normally take uh, and take them more frequently when teaching a synchronous offering. Thanks, Mark. And point number three, be prepared for issues. Disconnections, microphone issues, and other techni technical issues are just inevitable. Make sure to have backup support ready to go and stay calm in the face of any difficulties. How you deal with these problems can decrease frustration for everyone and make the classroom more comfortable. As a reminder, if you or your students are having any technical difficulties, remember the three R's. Refresh your browser, restart your browser, restart your computer. Section number three, class is over. After the class, it's feedback time. You might want to survey your students to get some feedback about the class, about your teaching and any tech issues that they had. There are many free survey makers and one of them is SurveyMonkey. If you want a link to SurveyMonkey, go to the chat box. You will need to create your own free account, create the survey from scratch or you can use their template and then send the link to your students. You can create this survey in advance so that you can send it to them the last day of the class or shortly after class is finished. Remember, take a student evaluations with a grain of salt. Not everybody is nice and even the best teachers get negative reviews, but most of the time if you do a good job, you're going to find the majority of the students are quite happy with the work that you did. You can view more about how the survey works by filling out a survey after this webinar. Our panelist, Heather, has one last tip that she would like to leave you with. Heather? Yes, Lisa, thank you. I'll keep this one quick, but I had one last tip for all the instructors out there. Have some fun with all these changes. Use this as an opportunity to put your stamp on virtual classes. If you're looking for new or fun ideas, check out the many online resources and professional communities out there. There's a lot of buzz right now around virtual learning and how instructors are coping and adapting. Look to your peers inside and outside the industry. I've gotten some fantastic ideas and have already added a couple new tricks to my routine. Remember your enthusiasm and positive energy shines through and will make your class more enjoyable and memorable for the students. Before I go, I wanna thank you all for the role you play in appraiser professional development. What you do matters. Great. Thank you so much for the closing tip, Heather. That wraps up all of our tips. But now, as we promised, we do have a live Q&A with all of our panelists. So I'd like to ask, well, you guys are awfully quick. All the panelists are back up on the screen right now and ready for any of your questions. I saw the uh, chat box going pretty, pretty quickly over there. Um, I want to thank you guys again for sharing all of your tips for us today. We want to use this time to answer any more questions people have, or if you guys want to go over some of the questions that were asked and elaborate on, on them. For example, I think one of the questions was immediately saying that, you know, my background, I go in and out of it a lot. And, and as Dan noted, it's probably because of my lighting and my white hair. I cannot figure out lighting to get my white hair to show up all the time. So if you guys have any more tips about lighting, I could use them. Um, to start off with, I think I would like to ask Joanne, I think she has a good story for us um, about floating hands. <laughs> well, thanks, Lisa. Um, your background can be dark, but if your lighting isn't right, and you wear colors, the same color as your background, you can look like just floating hands and faces. So be very careful about the color of background, your lighting, and what you're wearing, because you don't really want to look like some uh, 
I think of it as MTV. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. I've got a good question here in the chat box from Terry. It says, do you recommend sitting down? I see everybody is sitting down. How do you guys feel about sitting down? I'm used to standing up, so it's been a challenge for me to sit down because in a live classroom, I would pace, I have my whiteboard, so it's been a challenge to learn to sit down, and I was going to see if I could find a camera that would actually go on a tripod. I, uh -huh. It's been so fast and furious, I haven't been able to get it into all the things that I would like to look into at this point in time. And Lisa, I, I can tell you that I have... Uh, uh, experienced both. Uh, for the realtors that I uh, teach for in Kentucky, they have a, a room where the camera is on a tripod and we have both uh, participants uh, that will be remote and participants in the classroom. And that camera is moving and I can move about. I have a, a scripted area, of course, like a uh, out of bounds uh, area but I can move about, go to the whiteboard, uh, the camera will zoom in on that, and that's worked very well. But if I'm uh, teaching something like it, at where I'm sitting now is in my home, then no, I do, I do not have the ability to get up and move about. And you're exactly right, Joanne, learning to uh, stay in that chair and try to have the same dynamic that you would have teaching uh, standing is take some experience and time. Or at least it did. It does for me. Not just did. It does for me. Anybody else have a comment on that topic? No, but I do have a uh, comment on a different question that uh, from Scott Winter in the okay. uh, chat box about teaching to a live group and on Zoom at the same time. Uh, I've tried that, and it's really a challenge. It's, it's very interesting to do it because you have a live group and you've got live people raising their hands and then you've got a virtual group on a, on a screen uh, where you know, they can't raise their hands. And uh, it's, it was very, very challenging. It was different. We, we tried it. The, the, the company that I teach for uh, primarily um, tried it as a uh, kind of an experiment about, uh, I want to say it was about a year and a half ago. And it, it was an interesting experiment to, to, uh, to try it. But, uh, um, and I think there may be other providers who do it on a regular basis, I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, it, it has been tried and it's, uh, it requires a lot of technical help. You need oh, normally, yeah. uh, you need a, a moderator. And uh, when you're teaching in a live classroom, as we were talking about standing up, moving around, uh, when you're teaching in a live classroom, you can't just stand in one spot like a robot the whole time. So what you wind up doing is you sometimes you wind up even having a camera camera person. Okay, my <laughs> I almost said cameraman, <laughs> Texas camera person. You know, following you around the room, and uh, what you wind up with is a technical support team for a presentation like that. Wow, that sounds pretty complicated and expensive. <laughs> it, it, is. it was fun. It was fun to try, though. It was fun to try, <laughs> and, and we still do it uh, because we have folks not only coming in from the state uh, virtual, but it's out of state for this particular realtor course, and it's working well. But they, it takes a production team with you. I'm just the facilitator instructor. We got camera folks, we got sound folks, and it, you have to have the background set up before. It's sort of like a, uh, a studio. Uh, video studio. Well, I'm glad you guys are willing to try it. I've got a good question that popped up here. This is a common one I think we've all experienced, which is how, what tips do you guys have? I'll pick on you, Mark, first, for a dead audience. They're just quiet. How do you get them? Well, going? yeah, I can, I can tell you that, that even in a live classroom, uh, you know, as you get into a live classroom, Oftentimes, it's hard to get people to even enter in, in into a live classroom and to begin to, to participate in the, in the discussion. Uh, nobody really wants to be that one person that, that offers comments, or you have that one dominating personality that takes over everything. Uh, and the, the, the same is, is heightened in a synchronous uh, setting, 
where it's it's even more difficult to begin to draw people out uh, in in the classroom. The again the last the last session I had the first half of class was a little rough. Uh, it was mainly me me lecturing. Uh, I got very little feedback uh, from chat from from people asking questions. But kind of after after a couple of breaks and after I uh, interacted a little bit with with the students at break, uh, either by video or by chat, uh, they began to loosen up a little bit. They got comfortable with the software. Uh, they got comfortable with seeing themselves on video, which is, is new for a lot of folks. Uh, and, and it finally loosened up a little bit. And then we were able to have almost a, a similar classroom setting uh, with discussion back and forth and folks got used to kind of waiting just a little bit for, for others to respond and not talk over one another. And uh, it, it actually got to be very, uh, very comfortable in doing a, you know, a video audio situation with, with the students responding. So it actually works a little good. It just takes a little time for folks to get used to it. And I think the more we do it and the more folks get used to seeing themselves on screen, uh, the more more uh, natural it's going to be for for conversation. Uh, that's that's a good point, Heather. Do you have anything you want to add to that from your experiences? Just picking on you guys randomly. <laughs> <laughs> I think my experiences are the same as Mark. I okay. have found that um, you know it just depends on the class, but sometimes if you take that time leading up to the class to have just more general conversations about you know what's going on in the industry or in their market. Um, it kind of loosens them up as an icebreaker for setting the stage throughout the class. Um, I think sometimes if you just start off with put everything in the chat window, then when you want them to come off, <laughs> you know, chat and speak, they're usually hesitant. So anything you can do to just kind of encourage that engagement from the very beginning, you'll have a little bit more success. Perfect. That's, that's a great tip. Just as a show of hands, do any of you not use a moderator when you teach? So it looks like you all do. Okay, no, I don't know. Always, I don't know how you always, would do it without a moderator. Always use a moderator. Unless you had like three students. Yeah. Well, as I, as as I stated to someone in the chat, uh, the only time I've ever tried that was was less than twenty five people, and it was a class where I could do the uh, sign in with the photo ID. I began told them we would begin earlier signing in. I could then do uh, after each break. I could see the video at lunch. Say signed in. Uh, and then in the afternoon, they had to uh, uh, complete the evaluation and have it submitted online before the uh, uh, certificate would be submitted, because that is a requirement of both our real estate uh, appraisers and real estate licensees governing board. We have to submit that information and certify that we did that. Okay. Now, mm -hmm. over, over 2025, I, there's no way I would even agree to one without a moderator, or I call them a monitor, because they refer to them in our statute as class monitor. Okay. That, that a makes... hall monitor, just like in school. <laughs> you know, I think that, that might be where they got that, Joanne. That might be where they got that, the old hall monitor. Exactly. Um, how do you all take attendance? Um, do you do it each hour? Is there a specific method? I mean, Dan, do you want to address that? Do you want to start, Bob? That's largely the, uh, the responsibility of the moderator or, uh -huh. or monitor, Larry. And um, nor normally what we do is uh, right at the beginning of class, we have people holding up their, um, their IDs. And again, the, the, the tip about having them cover personal information, you know, there's your address on there, things that people, other people don't need to see. So we tell people just put, put a post-it note or a sticky note on there. All we need to see is your, is your name and your photo. So we know it's you and not your, of course, you have a twin brother. That's a whole different story, but let's not, let's not go down that <laughs> rabbit hole. But we have them take picture. We, we actually take a screenshot of everybody holding up their, their uh, ID and then the, the moderator knows what they look like and the moderator really throughout the class while I'm instructing or whoever's doing the, the presentation is just scrolling through the students and making sure that there's a face in front of every webcam. And uh, they typically do that several times an hour 
uh, to make sure that nobody just got up and walked away and, and left their webcam or turned the webcam off or, or whatever. So it's, it's an ongoing thing uh, that the, the moderator is responsible for, which again is if you get like six people in a, on a screen, anybody could do that, even the instructor. But when you have multiple screens, uh, it's just too difficult for a good sized group for the uh, presenter to um, to keep track of making sure everybody's in front of their webcam all the time. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Joanne, did you have something you wanted to add to that? Look like you might want to have something else. To well, add? the polling questions are what we use to take attendance and they have to answer the polling questions. And that's what IDEC requires for those three per hour. So that's the moderator's job to stick those out there randomly three times per hour in the 50 minutes because the regulations also require 50 minutes of teaching with the 10 minute break. So you're taking attendance three times an hour. And right. if students don't respond to that polling question, you have to send a call to action or a private chat to make sure that they're there. And if they don't respond, they get kicked out. Mm -hmm. And they're not happy about it. Yeah, <laughs> I can understand why. Um, we've got uh, a funny question. I just have to ask it because it's such a good one. Somebody wants to know, anybody have any good jokes to break the ice? <laughs> Joanne, Joanne, of course you do. <laughs> well, an appraiser's best answer is it depends, and it's not the underwear old people wear. <laughs> okay, that's pretty good. <laughs> or, you know, the best thing about being an appraiser is old appraisers never retire. They just change their highest and best use. <laughs> I have a feeling you can go on for hours with those jokes. Yes, okay. Um, so I want to ask, does anybody have a war story? Just raise your hand if you would like to share a war story. Well, the one thing I would, I would just say uh, is that expect problems uh, and anticipate them. Uh, the, uh, I had... I had an issue in a, in a Zoom chat one time come, uh, approached me is we had a, a lightning storm here in my office and it knocked out the electricity and I went away. Uh, and, uh, and then I had another situation where my computer just froze and, and you know, I had been speaking for five minutes and nobody heard anything. <laughs> so uh, this is where a moderator can, can be of, extreme assistance that if something is happening on the other end of the video screen that you don't know about, they can send you a text or call you or something and say, hey, Mark, you need to restart your computer. You need to refresh something uh, because, you know, things always go wrong. They go wrong in classroom. We have, you know, uh, bulb blow out in the projector screen and, you know, things, things go wrong. So I would expect that. Uh, kind of be somewhat prepared as best you can, uh, but don't get too frustrated. You know, things happen, we fix it, and we go on. Well, Mark, I know I just from knowing you, you are the king of cool. So, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> get advice from him. Larry, do you well, have no, a no short story for us? In the background, sorry. No matter what happens in the background, you never let the students see you sweat. I've started classes without moderators, I've started classes um, with. Uh, no power, thank God I'm on a laptop. Um, you know, it's just, it's just one of those things. I mean, you can prepare as much as you can ahead of time, but technology is not going to do anything. So never let them see you sweat. <laughs> it's easy enough with the touch up my appearance button. Um, Larry, do you have a horror story you want to share? Well, uh, sure, and, and I just agree with every everything said here, uh, you know, in the months that I've been doing this, uh, just expect uh, to find it will happen because things happen. But uh, the one thing I found, beginning the class, I always tell every student, whether it's someone who has taken classes before uh, Zoom or not, the uh, mute button, the stop video button, and the leave uh, half. It, you know, because if they click on leave, they're going out of the classroom if, they're, if they uh, make that click. So they have to come back in. But the one about the uh, stop video, we had a break. An individual gets up to uh, go uh, into another room and had uh, fully dressed uh, from the neck down to the waist. 
but not so much from the waist on down. And everybody was seeing that. And I'm like, oh my, oh my. So the luckily the, the moderator was able to uh, uh, knock it offline. But at the same time, uh, you know, just tell the students, please be, well, be aware when you get up and move about, stop that video because bad things and it's most unfortunate can happen. And then another one for me, I was knocked offline with a power outage and the moderator had to uh, take over uh, for the five minutes it took me to get back online. <laughs> so, so anyway, and, and uh, people said, well, my, that wouldn't happen in a classroom. Well, I beg to differ. You ever have a fire alarm go off and you have to move outside for a period of time while they clear uh, <laughs> everything good. So it, it's no different than live classroom. Uh, things will spring up. That's true. That's true. Um, somebody just emailed. They said, hey, why aren't you using your own rule and taking a 10 minute break? The class is going to end at about 10 minutes. So we decided not to take a break here today. Hopefully that isn't too too difficult for people just to wait a couple more minutes. Um, somebody actually had a good question here. Well, you all do. But this one applies to the video that we just presented here today. And that's that, you know, during Heather and, and I, when we were speaking on screen, our voice and audio were off a little bit. But for Mark and Larry, they were on, on. And the person was asking, do you think that they can expect that to happen? I'm not actually sure why that happened. Do any of you have any understanding of that? No, we don't know. So the answer to that is we don't know. Uh, I don't. I don't. I don't have an answer, so I won't even try to make. I know. <laughs> Neither do I. I was like, I don't know. That's over my pay grade. And, and norm <laughs> normally, my my initial reaction would be to bluff. Okay. You know, come up with something completely. Internet connection. It was. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Heather I, I would say. I, really, I would <laughs> say it could be just that. You know, you've yeah. got a delay in in uh, in the internet because it is driven, so it could. My guess is probably because Heather and I have a virtual screen and that usually takes more bandwidth and Mark and Larry don't. And I think that that's kind of impacting it, but very again, possible is my bluff answer. All right. I, so, it has to do with the frame cloud relay. Oh, that, yes. <laughs> that sounds real good. <laughs> Uh, somebody wanted to know if Heather's using a green screen. Uh, I don't think so. I think it's the virtual background. I think green screen is a whole nother level of technicality. That's correct. Just the virtual background. Okay, good. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm in my office uh, and, you know, the lighting overhead is really good, but it, I've got a really white door back here uh, and, and lighting in the back. So it's not the greatest, uh, but as long as I kind of stay within a reasonable distance from the from the camera that uh, it, it generally is 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 fairly good but uh, but yeah I need to go back and repaint that door or something darker uh, so uh, it, it does affect my, my background just a little bit but I do think you know that uh, that using a, a virtual background does eat up some bandwidth uh, and so you really got to have a pretty snappy uh, internet and, and computer to be able to do that with. I agree. And all I have is old stuff. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's Le the question. Lisa, Does there were a couple of questions from the chat that um, uh, I'm just going to clean up a couple of them from, that are getting a little old now. Uh -huh. uh, there were a couple of questions about USPAP courses, specifically the 15 hour USPAP course requires testing. And then there was a question about um, can students from other states get credit for a USPAP course uh, being taught in a certain state? And the answer is, uh, as Joanne might say, depends. Uh, it depends on uh, whether or not the course is approved in the other state as far as credit goes for the seven hour USPAP. And regarding the uh, proctored final exam for the 15 hour USPAP, it depends on the state's requirements for how the proctored exam is to be administered. In some states, believe it or not, they still require the, the USPAP uh, course exam to be administered via a paper and pencil exam with a live proctor in the room. Uh, other states will allow a, uh, a virtual proctor uh, and, and the exam to be taken electronically. So there's no set answer for that question. It depends on the, uh, depends on the state. Right. And for um, approvals in different states, um, it's kind of going to be state to state specific, as um, Heather will probably agree. 
We, we get approved in multiple states. However, you can typically petition your state board with a certificate that it's already approved in another state and possibly get credit. There's no guarantee on that. So if I teach a class that's approved in Colorado and a Nebraska student comes, they can take the certificate, they can show that it's approved in Colorado and they can petition the board to get credit for that class in Nebraska. That's not a guarantee all the way across and every state works so much differently. However, those courses that are approved through the course approval program, like the seven hour use path, are easier to cross states if the school is not approved. Did I hit them all, Heather? Yep. And I have personal experience with that because I'm licensed in five states and four of them will take it no matter where it's approved and one won't. <laughs> so it, it is by state. Yep, I agree. Um, since then, you know, watching the chat box go by so quickly here, did any of you catch any of the other questions I may have missed? Because there were quite a few good ones. It was just hard to keep up with them all. But there, is there anything else that any of you would like to add or that you saw from the chat box that you would like to answer before we uh, wrap it up for the day? I do have one quick tip. Um, knowing your audience and knowing that a lot of our audience isn't very technically advanced sometimes when it comes to virtual classrooms and Zoom meetings and everything. And one of the things that we found helpful because we, we do have a moderator is, you know, checking that attendance roster. If someone's missing, maybe reach out to them and just call them and ask if they need support because a lot of times they're getting very frustrated with things and they're trying to get on the call but just can't. And so one of the things that we learned really early on was just go that extra step, allow yourself enough time before class starts and have someone that's dedicated to that, but just reach out and say, hey, can I help you get online? If Sometimes it's time zone issues too, like <laughs> just that not knowing that, you know, because it's hard for us to put in different time zones and have it work with the technology so everybody gets their updates this you know the same so just think about that sometimes when you're setting up especially if your audience is new to the to the virtual environment it might save a lot of pain and heartache in the end and frustration and if i can add uh, one thing elisa that that's happened to us a number of times or to me a number of times you have people calling in with ipad with iphone and with computer and in each one of those unless they're really proficient with that device they run into problems and then you've got a moderator on the other on our end trying to uh, work with them to get into their system and the moderators just like i would be or certainly more uh more they would know more than i would but they have a problem they have to find all the specifics for that device so be prepared for that as well I think that's a very good, good point. That your, your moderator often knows more than we do. I can tell you that Aida and Joellen know a lot more about Zoom than I do. <laughs> and I've spent my fair share of time just Googling troubleshooting <laughs> problems. So use your resources. You're at your desk for the most part. Yep. That's right. Dan, There's a really good question that just popped up into the chat box about uh -huh. seminars can be taught virtually if approved by the state but that classes can be taught if they are approved as online classes only, is this correct? Again, it's gonna be state specific, but the appraisal subcommittee has approved that any state um, approved live course can be taught in the live online format currently without any additional approvals and every state has their own requirements on what documentation and notification the state needs for those classes. Unless that continues, CE and uh, licensing courses come January 1 will have to be IDEC approved, IDECC, International Distance Education um, Certification, whatever, it's IDEC. So, and some states won't let you have credit unless all of the instructors are CDEI. South Dakota is one of them. So you need to be aware of the requirements in the state you plan to teach in on what is approved, what requirements need, and what classes can just go live online now, and which ones have to go through the approval process. That's and really someone just posted a question, is IDEC planning to launch a new application process specific to synchronous 
aka Zoom. I have no idea. Maybe some of you all will. They 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 don't at this time, Larry. They they don't. And are um, they planning one? Are you aware of anything aware of, in no. the work? No. Okay. no. The ACB, however, is looking into um, separating the definitions between synchronous and asynchronous, which will take some time because currently distance education is the only thing that the AQB defines. And IDEC, unfortunately, is the only approval through that distance education. Thank you, Larry, because you're on, you were on the AQB. I don't know if you still are. I'm but not, I'm off. You know, actually, you know, Mark is the chair of that. And because this is such a huge topic, you're now getting into Joanne. We have, um, they want to go to our website. We, we have recorded a distance education webinar that explains all the topics yeah. that they could be discussing right now. That's but what I was today, gonna suggest. Yeah, that's perfect uh, for today. So we have come to the end of our webinar and all of our tips. And I just wanna thank you all for attending and especially thank you know, the panelists here for all the hard work that they did. You will see a handout in the chat box window with all the resources and everything that we mentioned. If you have any questions or comments, anything, please feel free to email me out. We will make sure and get whatever you need over to you. I'm at Lisa D at appraisalfoundation.org. And most importantly, as I mentioned at the beginning, if you are interested in joining a practice Zoom session to test all of your settings and to get real feedback from our you know, staff experts here, please fill out the survey that is in your browser and we are going to also post a link in the chat box. And as I always end probably every meeting with the Appraisal Foundation, I would like to say we want to hear from you. We need to hear from you. So the Appraisal Foundation is committed on making instructor transition to online courses seamless. We are planning to hold more webinars about teaching online. So please fill out the survey to indicate what topics you'd like to have covered. I see our mascot has showed up finally. <laughs> <laughs> and I would like to thank our think incredible, <laughs> incredible staff, Aida Dadaich and Joe Allen Alberts, they put all of this together in one month's time frame. Unbelievable. I'd like to thank our panelists again for all of your knowledge. And finally, I would like to leave you with a very inspirational quote. Perfection is impossible to obtain and competence does not require perfection. So thank you all. We'll post the, um, this webinar on our website and on our YouTube channel. So look for that. Email us with any questions. Have a great day. Be safe, stay healthy. Bye everybody. Bye-bye.